So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna bring my friend Fred Gamora back on. Fred, why don't you come join me over here? And we're gonna talk about a topic that's a little different from your typical medical things and we're gonna address, tell us, what's, what are you gonna talk about now? Well, today we're gonna talk about the fear of every ER physician and somebody that takes undifferentiated patients, the agitated or suspected agitated trauma patient. All right, take it away, right. Fred. So let's get started. Like my friend Shab said, my name is Fred Gamora. I'm an EM physician and also surgical critical care trained. Today, we're going to talk about the unruly trauma patient. Do we sedate or intubate? Now, before we get started, I have no disclosures. Now, the title of today's conference is The Golden Hour. This is the concept in which our pre-hospital EMS protocols, our trauma centers are built on, that time is survival. We have roughly an hour from the time of injury to get that patient to definitive care. Now, we have ATLS. As we already heard about, there's many things that go beyond ATLS. But ATLS was found with those ABCs to rapidly assess, diagnose, and treat trauma patients regardless of the setting in which they show up. Now, what do we do with our patient if we can't get past A, if all they're going to do is just scream or try to, hit, try to swing at us? Now, in an ideal world, every trauma patient or suspected trauma patient that meets activation criteria will go to the ivory tower. That's the place where... There's plenty of trauma bays, there's all the resources, trauma surgeons present at bedside, and protocols to rapidly make complex decisions. But as everybody watching today here, emergency physician, critical care physicians, and everybody tuning in, that's not realistically possible. Let's take, for example, so EMS brings to you a patient they found wandering around a transportation depot. He was agitated, mumbling to himself, maybe some dried blood on the face, maybe blood in the scalp, but when they got there, he was calm, collected, and really they're only transporting him in because he refused to leave. Or, for every ER physician watching today, that dreaded last hour of the shift knock on the back ambulance bay, where friends are dropping off the GSW, and you're just trying to tidy up, finish your charts, and get home. But now, these patients, obviously we're not going to be able to use ATLS because we can't even get near them. We have to keep in mind with the agitated trauma patient that agitation is often a marker of hypoperfusion and could be a sign of early hemorrhagic shock. Now, where are we left to go when these patients are so agitated that we can't even really rapidly assess them? We have to determine quickly, is this patient injured and agitated, agitated because they're injured, or agitated with no trauma at all? And for those folks that take care of routine agitated patients in the emergency department every day, this can be difficult enough without wondering if there's concomitant major traumatic injuries. Now, what we do for each patient is going to be a case-by-case -case scenario, but I think there is a few caveats that we know depending on the situation. And one of those is mechanism. Now, penetrating versus blunt trauma is going to be addressed slightly different. Penetrating trauma unfortunately presents in a fashion that's usually pretty obvious up front, and those folks we know 100% are most likely going to get transferred. For these folks, we're going to try to rapidly sedate, stabilize, and transfer them to definitive care. Blunt mechanism injury presents a whole separate challenge, that there can be major mechanism, but we're not quite sure if actually the extent of injuries, if they're present, or the definitive care that they're going to need. So for all my agitated patients that I recommend, and this comes with experiencing this firsthand, you need to set a time limit if you plan to sedate first. Often many trauma bays, I'd say most trauma bays that I've been, have a clock on the wall to keep track of this. Now, this should be a pretty short time limit, less than 20 minutes, because the last thing we want to do is time passes much faster than we expect. We don't want to be talking to the patient, trying to convince the patient to go to CAT scan, to get vital signs, and the next thing we know, 45 minutes to an hour have passed, and we finally find out that patient has a large intracranial hemorrhage, or they have an intradominal hemorrhage, and we're well behind the, behind the survival clock. Now, with any agitated patient, we're going to start our first step is going to be verbal de-escalation. Quickly talk to the patient. Assess, do they realize what's going on? Are they simply in pain? Offer pain medication. If this doesn't work right off the bat, don't complete re-engage to agitate the patient more, move on to the next step. With most agitated patients, we always talk about offering the patient or see if they're willing to take PO meds. Now, in a trauma setting, the last thing we're going to want to be doing is to be giving our, our patients things to try to eat and drink. 
And at the same time, the time of these onset of most of these medications are going to be far too slow for our rapid assessment tied to their survival. So that really leaves us, do we sedate or intubate our patients? Now I would say that remember, especially with our incredibly agitated patients, if vital signs are concerned, there's no way we've safely resuscitated our patient first. Now, we've already heard from talks today, and we're going to learn throughout why the trauma airway can be so difficult, and some of those are really cruxed on our ability to resuscitate. So we're going to sedate first, and a lot of this depends on, is the patient even willing to let us place an IV? Can we get close enough? Is he safe to hold down or too dangerous to staff? So I would say most of these times for these combative patients that are so agitated that they pose a danger to themselves or the people around them, our, our realistic options are looking IM. Now those options can be overwhelming. We have haloperidol, lanzapine, we have different benzodiazepines, we have ketamine, and really in the last several years, joperidol has really made a comeback. Now this is not an all-encompassing list, but what we do need is we need agent that is safe, rapidly effective, and can be given a single dose. The last thing we want to be trying to do to an agitated trauma patient is stab them with sharp things. I don't think that is going to de-escalate the situation. Now, from that list, and I'm sure many people watching today have listed plenty others, what are we supposed to proceed with? Do we break out the old B52, which has fallen on a favor, benzodiazepines, a combination of both, antipsychotics, and really reiterating what we need is fast, safe, and effective. And for me, I'm reaching for ketamine. Now, ketamine, easy dosing, anywhere from four to six megs per kg IM, which I, we can settle at five. Remember, the max dose is 500. It is readily absorbed, bioavailable, with an onset time anywhere, if you look across data, between five to 10 minutes. It gives pain and sedation properties. And for me, that is that is my first choice. Now we have to look. There's been a lot of recent studies looking at the DORM trial comparing joperidol, particularly to benzodiazepines in, in midazolam. But this is a drug that initially fell out of favor due to a black box warning, certainly for QTC prolongation and torts odds. But a lot of new studies are showing that that QTC prolongation might not be as prevalent as thought and actually has a relatively safe side effect profile. Now, Many of the studies are showing sedation with droperidol by 20 minutes, which again is at a sh the end of our time frame. Um, and depending on, your, depending on your center and your availability and comfort level, this is a viable option. So sedate first, plan for intubation if necessary. Make sure we're, while this is all going on, we're obtaining IV access, resuscitating, gathering blood products, making phone calls. But we need to know how to stabilize our patient and evaluate them quickly and completely. So where are we left? We've now sedated. Now, for a lot of these patients, they're gonna need definitive care and transfer, but it's gonna take more than that 15 or 20 minutes of sedation that your ketamine buys us. Now, we want an agent that keeps us spontaneously breathing, which ketamine does, but an adjunct to that after we have control and safety of the situation is think about dexamethamidine or Presidex. This is a drug that can be titrated, can, is often used for anesthesia, is often used for in the ICU, I use it very often, but also for procedural sedation. A good place to start is after you've sedated with that initial bolus of IM ketamine, you've now obtained good IV access, go to roughly 0.5 mg per kg per hour. You can titrate to effect, remember this is a trauma patient we're critically injured and worried about, that we need to be transferred in definitive care. But now what? What if you have that patient that is still too agitated, no longer protecting their airway, we have to move to intubation. If you look at EAST guidelines, for those patients who have failed to respond to appropriate pharmacologic therapy, they recommend intubation. But as we'll learn about throughout this conference today, intubation in the setting of a trauma, and especially a major trauma without presence of trauma surgeons for different care is incredibly challenging. Remember that airway is both anatomically and physiologically difficult. We take away that preload, we give sedation, and they can have cardiovascular collapse. So any patients that I'm looking to, to intubate with any hypotension, we're getting blood products ready. Remember, vital signs are key and important and early. Keep in mind, look at your shock index. 
But if we look at the patients that are intubated in the emergency department versus the OR, there's a higher level of cardiovascular collapse. In an ideal setting, you'd want your patient prepped and draped, intubated in the OR, in case they do cardiac arrest, in this, which case the trauma surgeon can quickly de obtain definitive management, either via an X-lap, a thoracotomy, and hemorrhage control. All right, so today, my take-home points. It's important to act fast. Time is survival. We need to take control of the situation. Sedate first before intubating. We want to maintain spontaneous respirations and always resuscitate before you intubate. All right. Thank you for taking the time to listen again. Here's my contact info, and I'll be glad to talk to the panel later on today.